The mouth is a complex structure, presenting some unique challenges to the artist hoping to accurately render its form. As always, a basic understanding of anatomy and careful observation of the reference material will be keys to success. Lips have a lot of surface texture and folds, which makes for quite a bit of detail that can be problematic to recreate. A better goal would be to attempt to capture the essence of the shape, color, and shading of the lips while just suggesting the complexity of the surface texturing. There are as many kinds of lips as there are people, but in most cases, the lower lip is thicker than the upper lip. It has a more pronounced curve from top to bottom, so it catches more light and will have a pronounced highlight, especially for women wearing lipstick. The upper lip will have much less curve, but more of a backward angle from top to bottom, so it usually appears darker due to being in shadow. The transition from lip color to skin color along the top of the upper lip is quite sharp. The transition on the bottom of the lower lip is much more gradual. Perhaps the most important thing to keep in mind is that lips are not flat from side to side. They curve back at the corners of the mouth, meaning that we have left to right shadows to consider as well as top to bottom shadows. You may have seen examples of portraits created exclusively with a gradient mesh approach. When done correctly in conjunction with an appropriate reference photo, it's possible to create a photographic likeness. It's not my preferred technique, but in some instances mesh is the best tool for the job, and in my view drawing lips is one of those instances. Let's talk about some general principles that have to do with working with gradient mesh. Some of the tutorials you will see will advise you to create the outline of the shape you want to work with first, then add gradient mesh points. That will work fine if the shape does not have too much of a curve to it. However, on a shape like this, watch what happens when I add mesh points. Ideally, the mesh lines run parallel to the edges of the shape, but for some reason Illustrator cannot figure out the new mesh lines should split the shape along the curve. Another possibility for creating mesh from the shape is to go to Object, Gradient Mesh. The resulting dialog box allows you to assign as many rows and columns as you want. Again, we see Illustrator's inability to handle the curve. A better approach is to start with a rectangle and then assign a very limited number of mesh points. Then we will use the white selection tool to change the shape of the rectangle to the curve we want. The mesh point control handles work a lot like pen tool control handles. Let's use the rotation tool here. Change the center of rotation to the right side, then bring these three points up to vertical. Let's do the same thing on the other side. Adjust the handles on the various points until you get roughly the shape you want. The advantage of doing it this way is that the points and the lines they control are going to run parallel to the edges of the shape in a much more logical way than what Illustrator will do on its own. Once the initial setup is complete, you can add control points that will create lines that follow a more predictable and useful path. Notice that adding a new mesh point adds a color based on whatever the current foreground color is. If you click on an existing line, you will get a new line running perpendicular to the original. If you click on color, but not on an existing path, you will get two lines that are perpendicular to each other. When you use the gradient mesh tool, you are also going to be using the eyedropper tool to designate mesh point colors with samples from the reference photo. The default for the tool is a point sample, meaning that you're only sampling the specific pixel you clicked on. I find that a 3x3 average yields better results. Start with a base color sample, the average lip color if you will. Now create a rectangle roughly the size of the lower lip. From the object menu, choose Gradient Mesh to access the tool's attributes panel. A few more segments than this will help to create the shape we need but adding too many at the beginning will make it difficult to achieve smooth blends. The difficulty here is that when this shape is filled up with a solid color, we can't see the reference photo below. Switching to the outline view is not helpful because now we can't see the reference photo at all. 
The solution is to go to the Layers palette, where the mesh is on one layer and the photo is on another. If we hold down the Command key and click on the Mesh Layer Eye icon, it will go to the Outline view while the reference photo layer stays in Preview mode. We get the best of both worlds. As I mentioned earlier, working with these mesh control points is a lot like working with pen path control points. So we're going to start with the white selection tool and begin moving the points and adjusting the handles to change the rectangle into the shape of the lip. We can add more points if we need to, but fewer is usually better. With the interior lines, we want to follow the curves of the form where we can. This is a particular problem we want to watch out for. If we move two points close together, the mesh point handles can overlap, and that usually means a blend between the two points that's not smooth. The quickest way to move these points together is to select all three, then use the scale tool to draw them together. Move them up to the corner of the mouth, then adjust the handles to round them off. Now that we have a good solid mesh foundation, we're going to go in and select individual mesh points and assign colors to them. With the white selection tool active, select the eyedropper tool. This allows us to hold down the command key to select a point, then release the command key to get back to the eyedropper tool to click on the photo to sample a representative color. We do this with each mesh point in the gradient. Sample carefully. For example, right here we will not sample the flesh color, but rather the lip color. We are going to address in a general way the fact that there is a highlight here, but we're not going to use the mesh tool to try and render the details of the little bumps of highlights and shadows. It's certainly possible to do it with gradient mesh, but it gets very complicated and time consuming, and quite frankly the lips would then look photorealistic and not fit the style of the rest of the illustration. Let's turn on the preview mode to see how the blending is coming along. We've gotten a pretty good idea of the shape of things. Now we can go back in and add more mesh points to create definition and detail, a little more like the photo without it becoming too photorealistic. As we look at the photo, we can see that there is a transition here, so we will get the mesh tool from the tool palette and click right here. This gets us another horizontal line with more mesh points that we can assign colors to. Let's do the same thing across the top of the lip. Every once in a while, switch to the preview mode to see how the blending looks. Notice that when we add mesh points, the course of the new path is determined by the shape of the existing lines on each side. That's why very careful configuration of the first few mesh lines will save you from problems and extra work down the road. For an issue like this, we can make the point active, then sample the point next to it to smooth out the blend. If we want a blend to move to the left, we can either move the mesh point to the left, or we can move the control handle to the left, and this handle also to the left to shift the shade over. This gives us a lot of control over the behavior of the blends. If we find we got carried away and added too many control points, we can select the mesh tool from the tool palette and then click on the offending point while holding down the option key. This will allow us to back out of a problem area without having to start over from the beginning. At this point, the lower lip and upper lip have been rendered as separate shapes with enough fidelity to describe the basic shape of the mouth. We do still have several problems. Problem number one is that the whole thing looks too smooth and clean, kind of plastic. We will deal with that issue in a moment, but the second problem is that this edge is much too sharp. The way to get around this issue is to use the white selection tool to activate all of the mesh points along the lower edge of the lip using the shift key to add more points to our selection, then go to the transparency panel and set the opacity to zero. What happens is that from this point to this point, the blend transitions from solid color to transparent. When we put the lips on the face, the blend of the shadow on the chin from light to dark will smoothly intersect with the bottom of the lip. A word of warning, however, you want to do this all at the end. If you go through and take the time to make all of these 0% opacity, then you come back and decide that you want to add some more vertices in here. Those will all be solid, the ones that you add, and then you have to go back and change them again. So wait till you have everything the way that you want it, and then do this bit last. 
we need to keep in mind that we're not trying to get an exact representation of the lips. Oddly enough, people will accept apparent structural anomalies in a photo, but not in an illustration that looks just like the photo. We want to show the highlights and shadows of the lip folds, but in a simplified, stylized way. We'll come in and draw a simple shape here to represent the fold shadows as well as here and up here. Then we will use our old friends Gaussian Blur and Opacity to make them more subtle. Let's get started. We'll create some white shapes here, roughly following the reference photo. Then apply a Gaussian Blur followed by a change of opacity of about 40%. We'll do the same thing with the shadows. They don't look so good right now, but we'll take care of that. By now, we know the drill. Gaussian Blur, followed by a reduction in opacity set to multiply. We can adjust these things back and forth until they look right. For example, we might look at the lower lip shadow and say, well, the upper shadow is fine, but the lower shadow is still too dark, so let's make the opacity even less. We can continue to make adjustments over time, but for now I think we're at a good stopping place. Viewed in the context of the rest of the illustration, this is certainly believable, especially when we zoom out and view it from more distance. Let's consider a smile where the teeth are showing. The first step is to outline the teeth as a group, which minimizes the look of individual teeth. Too much emphasis on the edge of each tooth makes the person look like they have braces even if they don't. Pure white teeth are too bright to be natural, so a four-color process light gray will be the base color. The teeth are drawn a little taller than they really are because the edge of the lips will cover the tops and bottoms. The lighting in the reference photo reveals that each tooth isn't flat. It has dimension with both shadows and highlights. This is another reason why the teeth must be slightly gray so that the white shadows will show. The key thing here is that we want to be very subtle in the way we represent these highlights and shadows. This is so people will see the overall smile more than the individual teeth. By this time, the highlight technique should be very familiar. Gaussian blurs and lowered opacity set to white shapes. Second verse, a little bit louder and a little bit worse on the shadows. Very light gray, just barely darker than the tooth base color. Gaussian blur, lowered opacity, and a blend mode set to multiply. Just as each individual tooth is curved, so too the entire row of teeth are curved. The two middle teeth are in front, with the teeth on the left and right curving back into the darkness of the mouth. We will create a shape to go over the teeth, then fill it with a gradient blend to accomplish the shading on each side. Here we see how it's created. Two white color wells on the inside, two dark gray color wells on the outside. Changing the blend mode to multiply makes the white in the gradient turn transparent and adds the value of the grays to the value of the teeth to make them gradually get dark heading out to the sides. This is the result when we add back in the highlights and shadows on the individual teeth. You're probably thinking, oh my gosh, those are much too dark to be attractive. But keep in mind that we have to view the teeth in the context of the lips and gums. Because the lips are much darker than the teeth, they'll look lighter in comparison. Let's add the gums and put them on a layer behind the teeth so that the shading gradient will interact with them also. Already the teeth are looking lighter. Adding the lips makes the teeth look even better. One more little detail and then we're finished. Using the same technique we used to add lash shadows on the eyes, so here too, let's add an upper lip shadow on the teeth. The lips could use more attention, but I think there's enough to understand the concept here of rendering the teeth. There you have it. Thanks for watching. I hope you found this information helpful. Please stay tuned for the fourth video in this series, which will cover how to use shape-to-shape -shape blends to render the forms of the face.